So we're going to start in the book of Philippians. Paul is writing a letter to the church in Philippi. And these people have been so generous towards his ministry and helping him do everything that God wanted him to do. And he was expressing his heart of gratitude towards them because they've been so generous. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. See that? He's saying, thank you. You've revived your concern for my financial well-being. He says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He's saying, hey, I didn't give you an opportunity to give an offering, and so now I'm going to give you that opportunity. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned. And here's what I want you to dial in with me at this series. I want you to learn what it is to be a follower of Jesus, even when it concerns my money, and my finances. He says, in whatever situation, I am to be content. Oh, what a wonderful word, content. Makes me just want to sit down and snuggle up with a hot cocoa in my lap right here. He's saying, I can go through life being content. I don't think for a lot of us that we've ever really even stepped into that place of just feeling, I'm content, I'm okay. I'm going to make it. I'm going to survive. He says, I've learned the secret of being content. There's, there's a secret there. There's something that you and I pull up a, ta- a chair to the table and, and really understand what God's trying to teach us. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many times have we heard this verse, but we've never really thought about the context. He's saying, I can do all things through him who gives me strength because I've learned the secret of being content. Whether I have plenty or whether I have a need, I have learned the secret of being content. We've entitled today's message, wise choices. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to your word today with a a hunger in our hearts to know more of what you want to do in us. Father, I pray for the next few moments that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into truth so that we can live according to your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've got a treat for you, okay? I'm going to step back here. I'm going to grab it, okay? So this is something that I discovered uh, probably through like a TikTok or something like that. It's called, it's called an electric shovel. Yeah! And I bought it after it snowed, the most recent snow, and, and then it didn't snow again. And it doesn't look like it's going to snow for the rest of the year. So I brought it here because I wanted to try it out. In fact, this morning, I, I hooked it up. So it's got this multi-tool attachment thing. And then you can like put like a chainsaw or an edger or a weed whacker and all that kind of stuff. And so I have a lot of other electric equipment. And when I saw this electric shovel, I was like, yeah. I just couldn't wait to try it. But I really wanted to try it because... When you, when you have a snow situation that you have to deal with, you, the last thing you want to do is try out for the first time, right? Yeah, I had taken it out the box, took the packaging off of it, and I wanted to make sure I knew how to use it because when the snow happens and you got to deal with it so that you could get to the job or get wherever you got to go, you need to get the snow out of the way so that you can move on with your day, right? You don't want to be stuck in that moment. And I wanted to use this as an illustration to lead us into this first idea that I want to bring to you today. Because when you get money, you don't want to have to figure out how to manage it once you receive it. You want to know exactly what you want to do. You want to have a plan, and you don't want to be surprised by it. When there's a snowfall or a windfall in your life, and you receive this money, you want to know exactly what my plan is and how I'm going to execute it, because that's what wise, responsible believers in Jesus Christ do. And God's word is full of advice. It's full of wisdom to give us so that we know exactly how to handle it. And so I want to jump into the first idea, and that is spend less than you earn. 
I know that that's the most non-sexy thing to be able to tell somebody, okay? Spend less than you earn. But I need you to know this. I need the young people in the room to know this. I need college students and young adults. I need you to know the world is going to tell you, spend all of it. They're going to tell you tonight. They're going to have all of these commercials that are going to come on during the game. And they're going to tell you where you need to put your money. And what I'm saying is, you get to decide what you do with your money. Nobody else gets to decide that. That is a decision that you make before the Lord, saying, God, I want to be a good steward, manager of everything that you've brought into my life, and I want to be responsible. And so what you've got to know is, don't spend more than you make. Don't go into debt just frivolously, just because you think you need this VR headset thing that people are spending $3,000 on, okay? I know some of you, that's what I want to do with my money. Then go for it. Buy the VR headset. But what I'm saying is don't let someone else tell you and basically take your money away from you. You get to direct it. You get to tell it. And the, the Bible is full of this. Listen to what the scripture says. It says this in Ecclesiastes 5.10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. What he's saying is you can can have all the money in the world and it's never going to be enough unless you determine within yourself, this is my limit. And I'm not going to spend more than I make. I'm not going to have an outgo that's greater than my income. I'm going to live within my means. People are thinking, well, if I just had more money, all of my money problems would go away. And the scripture tells us that if you don't know how to do it with the little that you have now, you're never going to know what to do once you have a larger amount. There are people with large incomes, but because they don't know how to progressively stay within their means, They're always needing something else to make us happy. If I just had more, then it would be enough. And we've got to recognize that God's the owner of everything and that I'm here to manage everything that he's put in my life. I'm here to steward what God owns, and that's what the scripture says. In Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. It's all his. First Chronicles says it. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. God owns everything, and that even means the things that come into our hands. We're to manage it well because it belongs to him. And it really becomes that every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Every time I choose to spend something, it's something that's a spiritual interaction because I'm doing it with God's resources. God is the owner of everything. The second thing that we want to talk about today is avoid the use of debt. I didn't say don't go into debt because there are times with a mortgage and things like that. It's a, it's a good investment and it's a good way to posture yourself. But don't use debt as a way that you're going to be able to get forward financially. Every time you go into debt, it's a time where you're taking a step back from having all of the resources that you have. Think, of, think if you didn't have any payments for anything at all. No, no, no credit card payment. No, no mortgage payment, no medical bill payment. Think of the power of the income that you would have. Wow. You could direct it where you wanted to send it. You could invest and save. You could begin to build wealth. What happens is every time that you take on a new debt, you're, you're, you're diluting your financial strength and you're no longer able to use it in the way that you want to because now it's assigned to something else. 
That's why creating a budget is so important. A budget is writing down everything that I'm going to spend on paper in advance before I do it. John Maxwell says that a budget is telling your money where you want it to go rather than wondering where it went. How many times do we just sit here and be like, I just got paid on Friday. Where's all the money at? And what we have to do is we have to realize that we're in control of this. This thing called our income, we are in financial power. And so many times debt will rob us of that power. And there are entire businesses that are built on taking advantage of people who don't understand that debt is not something that you want a part of your life. There's, there's places that give payday loans. I'm going to loan you the money, and then when you get paid, I'm going to take it. You should say no. Some of us need to, in the name of Jesus, draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to let debt rob me anymore from the financial power that I have. Here's what I'd love. I'd love to be able to say, church, we're going to build a new parking lot this year. Let's all give $200,000 to make this happen. And everybody say, got it. Let's do it. I'm going to make a plan. Let's make it happen. But so many of us are limited, and we say, pastor, I'd love to be a part of that, but... And I'm saying, don't let it have that power over you anymore. If you want to be generous towards things, make a decision, make a plan, save, and get ready, and let's go. That's how you need to be postured against it. The Bible talks about debt a lot. It says the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. I, I hope that you're like me. You're saying, hey, nobody's calling me a slave. Nobody's taking advantage of me. Well, then, then stop letting it. It's, the Bible is very clear. The borrower is the slave to the lender. What you and I have to do is we have to get on the other side of this equation. I want to be the lender from now on. I want to be the rich. I want to be the person. And I'm going to get there, and it's just going to take some steady, concerted effort in order to get there. The Bible gives us an example of this, and it uses this illustration of an ant. <laughs> I, I love this because it takes one of the smallest things in the world and it says, if you want to have financial power about your life, go to the ant. In Proverbs chapter 6, it says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food at harvest. When do... You make decisions about your finances in the summer or at harvest. When you have the resources, the ant is deciding when that time comes, I'm going to start storing up. I'm going to start saving for the future. I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to stick to it. Isn't it amazing to think that God gives us such a basic illustration to teach us such a huge life-changing lesson? Listen, if you get your money right, your family is going to be set on a path that's going to be different from the way that you and I were raised because we're going to have a plan that's in front of us. Right now, the world's screaming at you saying, you need to buy all of this and get in debt. And the word is very quietly whispering secrets to us saying, hey, 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 consider the ant. Do you know, do you know how hard it is to consider an ant? I mean, you've got to like get up close to that thing. You can't consider an ant from a long ways away. It takes focus. What I'm asking you to do today is hear what God says about how to manage his money, and you're going to find that your life is transformed. My wife and I, we made a decision a long time ago. We're not going to make a car payment. What that means is we don't have the latest and greatest, okay? We, we buy cars when other people are done with them. <laughs> but we decided, you know what? I would rather not live under the stress of having a car payment. I would rather just drive a vehicle that's paid for. And I'm going to not have as nice a stuff as everybody else. I keep it clean. <laughs> it, it, it looks good. It drives really well. And, and it's because I, I've made a decision that I want to tell my money what to do rather than it tell me what to do. My mom, many of you guys know, my dad passed away back in 2022, and so my mom's kind of learning how to do life without my dad and um, kind of walk alongside of her a lot of things. And yesterday, she purchased her first vehicle in her whole life. 
She had never purchased a vehicle in her whole life. And so she went to the dealership, and I was coaching her through everything over the phone and stuff, and I was so proud of her. But listen, she got to that place because her and my father made decisions about how they were going to manage their money and say, hey, we're not going to be put under this stress or this vice grip of financial pressure. So many of us, we go through life just always thinking about money and how it's going to control me. That's not how God wants us to live. God wants us to live in financial freedom. He wants us to be free. So avoid the use of debt. The third thing is this, build margin. That means don't live all the way up to the edges. Some of us financially are all, we're over the edge. We're over the edge. We're living all the way up. God says in his word to his people when he was teaching the children of Israel, he said, hey, when you're growing your crops, don't, don't harvest all the way to the edge. Leave, leave some margin. He, he actually says, he says, because there might be a foreigner among you. There might be an immigrant in the area that needs. Let them just go ahead and get, get around the edges. What, what God is saying is, he's saying, don't bleed your life all the way up to the edge. Some people get stressed out when they look at my message notes. Because I, I make my margins really small because I want to try to fit as much as I can onto one page. And some people look at it and they get stressed out. No margins there. There's no edge. There's, there's no buffer zone. Where am I going to write an extra little note at? Listen, some people, you live your lives like I have my message notes. You're all the way up to the edge. And you just need to back away a little bit. Don't spend it all. Don't, don't do, have a little bit of margin. Listen, what margin does is it creates the ability for you to just do things when God tells you to do it. Hey, I want you to buy that person their lunch right there. I want you to, I want you to, hey, Drive through, okay, I want you to pay for the car behind you, you know. There, there's just times where the Holy Spirit would just whisper to you to just do something that's good and kind to someone else. But if you're always living up to the very edge, there's not that space that's available. And then you have to tell God, no. You don't want to have to do that. But sometimes, because of our decisions, we've not left that margin that we needed. Once again, we're going to look at the ant here in Proverbs chapter 30. He says, four things on earth are small, but they're exceedingly wise. And he, he lists four things, and I'm just going to read the first one to you in verse 25. The ants are a people, not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. He's saying, this is what's extremely wise. Once again, look at what the ant is doing, and the ant has built this margin in order to store the food... Because winter's coming. Because, because there are times that are coming up ahead, and you and I need to learn how to build that kind of margin in our lives so we can do it God's way. Listen, rich people get rich slowly. <laughs> they, they get rich slowly. They build wealth slowly. They save and invest and save and invest and save and invest in their 20s, into their 30s, into their 40s. They're doing it. I'm working the plan. I've got a plan, and I'm working it out. And pretty soon you get to this place where you're like, okay. You know, someday Bianca and I are going to be able to go and buy a new car. Someday it's going to happen because we're going to build ourselves on this end so that later on that we can do some of the things that we were never able to do. Even though we were able, we didn't take advantage of it because we wanted to be like an ant. <laughs> we wanted to store our food in the summer because winter's coming. And I think that long-term understanding that there's more coming and we, we all pray that the Lord comes and rescues us and raptures us up out of here. And get, but if he's going to wait a little bit longer, what we need to do is we need to have a plan so that we're ready for everything that's lying in front of us. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 11, it says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. If you hear anything today, hear it the little by little. You might be saying, oh, Pastor, I just got so little. Oh, that's, a, that's a qualification right there for building that wealth, for being rich. Because he says, he says, fast money dwindles. You ever heard people that win the lottery and you're thinking all their financial problems and then they go bankrupt a few years later and people are like, how did that even happen? Listen, there is an epidemic right now with sports betting. 
Sports betting is becoming a huge problem for people. People are gambling money away that they don't even have in the first place. And they're taking it and they're throwing it away and throwing it away. My dad, he was a great man, taught me so much. There was one time where we were attending a wedding that was in a casino. I had never gambled before. I had just graduated from this drug rehabilitation program that I had went through. My dad gave me $20. He said, go, go gamble. And I took it and a few minutes later it was gone. <laughs> I came back to him and he said, what did you learn? And I was like, I'm not very good at this. He said, aren't you glad that I didn't gamble away your mother and my, our money? And I said, that was the last time I gambled anything. I was like, we're done with that, you know? That's a $20 lesson right there to learn. I don't want to throw all my money away. Because we have to understand, it's little by little, all that little, oh, it's just $5. You're, if, if you have that mindset, you're missing it. It's little. It's that little $5 right there that I can put into this thing, and I can start saving, and I can start investing. And someday that little is going to become a whole lot more, but it's only going to happen when I realize how to utilize it properly. And the last thing that we want to talk about today is to set long-term goals, like binocular goals, okay, like grab it and like way out there. You see that over there? I'm going to get there someday. I got a goal. I'm going to save this. I'm going to invest this. I'm going to have an investment property that I'm going to have some kind of return on. There's something that I want to invest in. Because here's the thing. Consumption now costs opportunity later. Let me say that again. Consumption now costs opportunity later. Which means if I consume it right now, it's not going to be available for the later. But here's the thing. You and I have the opportunity to make sure that we do what God has called us to do and that we utilize it properly. Ron Blue, he's the author of this book. And if you want more information on this, I'd encourage you to get it. It's called Master Your Money. Master Your Money. And he says this in the book. He says, your money is the only part of the Christian life that can't be faked. You can put on a good show in front of other people, but when we look at your checkbook, yep. for all the young people in the room, this is like a register, okay? <laughs> and, and you're supposed to write down every time that you write a check so that you know how much money you have in your account, okay? I know that for some of us, online banking has replaced that. But you can't fake it. I, I, I could tell you all day long, I, I, good talk, man. I can lift up hands and we can, we can have a little show. We can do the whole worship dance. I mean, we can do it all, but, but you can't fake your money. It's, it's, money has no emotions to it. It doesn't, doesn't feel. <laughs> it's numbers. You look at the number and the number is what it is. And it's, it's, it's a reflection of what we value. What you spend your money on shows what you value. And for some of us, the realization that I've not valued God shows up. And just look at it. And to say, I want to make it different. So I want you just to bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I've got sin in my life. I've been going my own way. And I've not been acknowledging God the way that I need to. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I need to get my life right with God. That's the very first fundamental step to taking this whole journey forward is to make sure that you know the Lord yourself. Not somebody else's faith, not, not my mom or my grandma's faith. No, it's, it's mine because I know God for myself. And here's the good news. The good news is that you and I couldn't get there on our own. You and I couldn't give enough money. We couldn't serve enough hours. We couldn't pray long or hard enough to save ourselves. And God knew this. And he made a way for you to come to him. And he made that way himself. He willingly sacrificed his own life. He died on a cross so that you could be saved. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I believe 
that God saved me. I believe that he washed me. I believe that he did that for me. I want, I want all of us to have that opportunity, to have that assurance in our hearts, to know that God has saved us and transformed us from the inside out. It begins with a prayer. It begins on you calling out to the Lord and saying to him, God, would you save me from my sins? Maybe you're here today and you want to pray that prayer. We want to pray with you. In fact, all of us want to celebrate you praying this prayer. If that's you and you're saying, Pastor, I, I need to get my life right with God and I want to pray and invite him to save me from my sins. If that's you here today, on the count of three, lift up your hand all across this room. One, two, three. Just lift up your hand saying, I want to pray. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe you're online and you want to pray too. Right now is this moment. I want everybody in the sound of my voice, repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died in my place so I could be born again. God, wash away my sin and give me a brand new start. Jesus, I believe in you. And I thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we thank the Lord in this place for his goodness? God, we thank you for your goodness, God. You're wonderful.